morning, including the psalm that we read part of as our call to worship this morning, are from the lectionary, the schedule of readings. And in year B, which we enter, Happy New Year, by the way, because the new year for the Christian church begins on the first Sunday of Advent, we move to Mark's gospel, the shortest of the gospels, the oldest of the gospels, the most direct and to the point of the gospels, direct and to the point being the cross of Jesus Christ. We're beginning with another hard passage of um, eschatological stuff, meaning the end times, as Jesus is addressing his disciples. There are only 16 chapters in Mark's gospel, so we're very near the end. We're coming up upon his passion, and these are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, recorded by Mark. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that the summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on watch. Therefore, keep awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Like I said, the lectionary kind of doesn't mince many words this time of year. And I remember once preaching um, on Christmas Eve, what I thought was a very good sermon, actually. I worked long and hard on it to have someone come up to me and say, we don't want theology. Actually, she said, we don't want no stinking theology. We want the baby Jesus. We want the lambs and the shepherds. We want all the beauty. We don't want to hear about anything but what feels good. So I hope this one doesn't fall too far from that mark, but I think it might, because this is a theological time of year, and we need to unpack what we just read. Now, Back in March, can you remember March, the last time when we all gathered together in the sanctuary and took for granted that we'd see each other next Sunday? Remember that? That was during the season of Lent. We got to the second Sunday of Lent, and then it all just fell apart. So on my Facebook page, I posted a meme, you know, one of those little pictures that somebody makes up with a saying on it. And people loved this one, and I saw it, and I immediately shared it. And it says, this is the Lentiest Lent I've ever Lented. Now we're entering Advent. Advent, those lovely four weeks before Christmas. And the word Advent itself means coming or arrival. And if I were to come up with a meme for Advent, I would say, this is the liminal, I gotta, let me try that again. I do speak for a living. This is the liminalist liminal space I've ever eliminated. We're gonna talk about liminal space in the study that I'm beginning this evening. And it's not really one of those buzzwords that we hear a lot of lately, although it has come into the common parlance more lately. Liminality or liminal space, that comes from a Latin word that means threshold, the word limen. The space or time between what was and what has yet to be. I don't know if you're as tired as I am of hearing all these words attached to the COVID pandemic and the election and everything else. Unprecedented. Are you tired of hearing unprecedented? How about new normal? I don't think there's anything I like less than hearing. This is our new normal. Or even anticipatory grief, which is what we're experiencing now, which is sort of a fancy way of saying worry. We're worried, we're obsessed with what might happen that could be deadly and devastating to us. Now, I want you to know I'm not a fan of pop psychology, and I'm certainly not a fan of pop theology, but the term liminality has been around since 1909. It was a French anthropologist named Arnold van Gennep whose work 
was rediscovered and expounded upon in the 1960s by a sociologist named Victor Turner, found its way into modern psychology, and finally it's made its way into theology and contemplative spirituality. Thanks a lot to Father Richard Rohr. Some of you may be familiar with his writings. He's a Franciscan priest. And Father Rohr sees liminal space as something to be embraced, that time where we don't know what's going to happen next. One of the best memes I've seen on liminal space, and yes, there are memes on liminal space, is someone on a trapeze letting go and not quite there to be grabbed by the other person yet. That's what liminal space feels like. When you don't know what is coming next, you just know that you have no way back to where you've been. But Father Rohr wants us to embrace this time, this unknown, this weird in-between threshold that we're crossing into, because it's a chance to open ourselves more fully to what God sees possible for each of us. Now, you're already sitting there going, why did I come this morning? This is one of those theology sermons. This is one of those not-so-happy sermons. We want Christmas. Hasn't anyone told her we want to sing some Christmas hymns, some carols? We want to feel good. We want those shepherds and the baby Jesus. We don't want none of this stinking theology business. But Christmas really is about looking back. It's about looking back to the time of Jesus' birth. But for most of us, it's about looking back to the times we spent with our families. Some folks have had their happiest, warmest memories around Christmas time, either with your family at home or with parents maybe who have gone on to claim their reward with Christ. We like the nostalgia of Christmas. We like that warm, fuzzy feeling that it gives us. But while Christmas is about looking back, Advent is about looking forward. This is not the season of preparation as in this is when you bake your cookies and your fruit cakes. This is not a glorified baby shower for the Virgin Mary, which is sometimes how we treat it. Advent is about looking to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And here we are, betwixt and between, not there yet. I think that helps us to understand the cry of the prophet Isaiah, Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down. That was certainly a liminal time for the people of the Hebrews. That was the time when they were returning from the Babylonian exile. That was the time when they came back into the land but found it wasn't as they remembered because their nostalgia was for a land that no longer existed. And the Babylonian exile was ended by the Persian Empire. And you're probably now thinking, oh, now we get theology and a lot of history that we don't need. But it was still a time that the Jews had no self-determination, even though it was the Persian Empire that overcame Babylon and allowed them to return to their homes. Cyrus of Persia was even referred to in Scripture as a Messiah, not the Messiah, but as one anointed by God for a specific task. But oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down is a little bit of a look to the past. It's looking back to Moses on Mount Sinai when the mountain shook and the cloud descended and Moses was there with God in the presence of God while the people looked on in wonder, finally giving up because that was too much liminal time for them. They couldn't do it anymore, so what did they do? They made themselves an idol because they thought Moses was lost to them. But even though they're looking backwards and saying, God, come down as you did before onto the mountain, they're looking forward to the time of God's Messiah coming, the Messiah, the one who had been promised to them. But can't you understand that cry, oh God, come down, oh God, where are you? Oh God, we need you so desperately, come to us now. Mark, the gospel lesson that we just read is one of those spooky ones filled with images of blood and fire and predictions that don't seem very comfortable to us. It's about expecting Christ to return though, even though Jesus is saying these words. You have to understand that Mark's gospel was written at the time when Jerusalem was totally destroyed in 70 AD. So the writer of Mark's gospel is putting great emphasis on these times that Jesus is telling us to watch out, to keep our hope, but to be on watch. And the Corinthian church, they're occupying the same liminal space as Mark's audience, waiting for the return of Christ after his resurrection. That's the same liminal space we find ourselves in, waiting the second coming of Christ. And what does Jesus say to us? Is keep awake, still today, keep awake, be alert, wake up. 
And if we're going to embrace or lean into this season of liminality, this time of the unknown, if we're going to open ourselves up to what God could be doing in the world through us, if we put our hope and our faith there, we have to think about staying awake. I always come to this Sunday of Advent and I think about a lady named Nancy who was one of my organists in years past. Every first Sunday in Advent, Nancy would play on the organ, Vacheth Off. Are you familiar with that piece of music? It means sleepers wake. Da, 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 da. She was great through that, but then I got to the da, 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 I'd look over at her. She'd be turning redder and redder and redder. Tears would start to come out the corners of her eye, and then she would just totally derail. And we went from da, 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 womp, 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 until she was in a full fit, sobbing hysterically. Now, after the third time this happened, I said, Nancy girl, why don't you just give it up and let yourself go? She was an excellent organist, but sometimes if you've been a musician, you know there is one piece of music that doesn't matter how skilled you are, if you get it in your head that you can't play it, you'll never be able to play it. And Nancy looked at me crying through her tears and she said, because Advent is the season of hope. And every year, I hope I'm going to get through the piece of music. We're here to talk about hope. We're here to acknowledge our sin like the folks that Isaiah is talking about where they cried out to God. They said, we're like a filthy piece of cloth. But Lord, remember us. Remember who we are. Remember that we are clay in your hands. There's a sense of acknowledgement of sin and repentance of sin and saying to God, remember the promises you made for us. Remember the promises that you have, the future that you have. We're in your hands, Lord. We are putty in your hands. We are the clay and you are the potter. Now, my whole theological outlook, which I've had years in formation, begins in the future. My theology begins with the final triumph of God's righteousness. In seminary, I read a relatively new theologian in those days named Jürgen Moltmann, who now is sort of old school, who talks about starting your theology in the future reign of Christ. Because if your hope is in the coming of Christ, that changes the world you live in now because you can't live the way things are. You can't say in the sweet by and by we'll all understand it. You can't say farther along we'll know all about it. Farther along we'll understand why. What you say is, I know who Christ is, and I know who Christ will be, and I will live in that future reality. I will embody that kingdom. I will live the reign of Christ here and now. Which means that you don't say to people who are oppressed, just hang on, Jesus is coming one day, and everything will be great then. But what it says is, no, if I see injustice, I will speak out against it, and I will work to end it, because it, anything less is antithetical to the gospel and the reign of Christ Jesus, our Savior. And Paul gives us hope, too, because what does he say to us but that we are not lacking in any spiritual gift as we await the revealing of Lord Jesus Christ? It means we have everything we need to get to that other side. We have the gifts that have been poured into us through the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, because Pentecost is both past and future and present. And we remember that God did indeed tear the heavens open and come down. But not with fire, not with quaking mountains, but in the bodily form of a dove as he descended onto his son and said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. God who sees us as children, God whose promises will not fail us, we are clay in his hand. I had a potter in one of my congregations. We got to be good friends and this isn't the most famous potter passage. You know, God said to Jeremiah, go to the potter's house and watch what happens. So I asked him on that Sunday, I said, would you please come in, bring your wheel, throw a pot, destroy it at the right moment, and then do one that's perfect. And he said, oh, no pressure there. He was a ceramic artist more than a potter at the end of his career. And he did not work at a wheel very often. And he said he was never really great at it. But he said he was sitting there in the church and everyone was fascinated because God didn't say, Jeremiah, imagine a potter. He said, go to the potter's house and watch what he does. And so everyone was just, just sitting, leaning forward, watching this beautiful vase take shape. And Charlie told me later, the potter, he said, that was the best piece of pottery I ever threw in my life and I had to stick my finger in and wreck it. 
on cue. But the next one he made was not quite as perfect as the first, but it stayed together. And he said that was the Holy Spirit intervening on behalf of my sermon that morning. But he told me something I didn't know about clay, because I don't work with clay. He said, you know that clay, it doesn't matter how long it's been shaped, it doesn't matter how dry it's become, until it is subjected to the fire of the kiln, it can be, it can be reformed. All you do is soak it, and then it becomes pliable again. And that is what God is trying to say to us. Until we are subjected to the fire, take that as you will, there is hope for us in the world to be changed into something that serves God, a vessel that could be filled with God's Holy Spirit. So here we are in this God-awful in-between time. We don't know what is coming. And I don't know if you're on social media and you read the prayers that people are asking for for their friends who are being diagnosed, who are going into the hospital, who are going into ICUs. One of my friends who lives in California posted today, two of my best friends died this week of COVID. Someone else said, my aunt just entered ICU and is not expected to survive. Woody Bannister died this week of COVID and his wife Boots is still in ICU right now. We know that this is a time when we don't know what's coming down the road. Although we know that Christ is there already awaiting us. We can live in that future no matter what happens to us now, we can continue to proclaim Christ, crucified, risen, who was and is and is to come again. That's the promise that we have. That is why I get up every Sunday morning and come here and proclaim Jesus Christ, risen. Jesus Christ, who reigns. Jesus Christ, who will come again to bring justice to the earth. And until that time, we are here to proclaim. We are given gifts. We are given each other to love. We are dispensers of hope, which is why we're lighting this candle this morning. In a world that seems rather hopeless these days, we are proclaiming our hope in Jesus Christ. And we need to remind each other of that because so many people are struggling right now. Always, Paul wrote in another of his epistles, be prepared to let someone know the reason for the hope you have in Christ. I hope that you can embrace this time. We don't know what's going to happen in churches, and the estimates are that a good third of the people who used to worship with any church, not just Epworth, but in any congregation, will not come back after the pandemic finally ends and we're back to fully functioning. This is not a new normal. This is a liminal space. We're going to get through this to the other side. We may not all survive to the other side, but we will go on with Christ whether here or in the world to come. So I hope that during this season of Advent, this season of coming and promise, that you can learn to embrace the uncertainty of this age, knowing that you have a certainty in the age that is to come, that Christ who died for you is going to come again and take you as his own, so that this isn't just something that we talk about, this pie-in-the-sky notion of Christ returning. It's not part of a doctrine or part of a creed, but it is what forms us and defines our faith every day in the life that we lead here and now. I'll try next week to talk more about the baby Jesus and the lambs and the shepherds and the good stuff. We're going to sing some Christmas carols, not today yet, but we're going to get there. I'm not going to make you wait until Christmas, but right now, Look to the future. Look to the past with grateful hearts for the stories of Jesus Christ, our Savior, but don't keep him in the past or you will lose your hope in what he has promised you. And we are people of hope. We are people of the kingdom. We are people of the future reign of Christ. We just have to decide that that is the threshold that we will cross through boldly and fearlessly in God's most holy name. Amen.